Hello and welcome to another edition of Office Hours. I'll be your host for today, Brent Ozar, answering your questions about Microsoft SQL Server, Azure SQL DB, whatever database related stuff you put inside there. I am in the Reykjavik Harbor. That is the monument to EVE Online, a uh, big uh, online game uh, started by CCP Games, oh, I don't know, like 15, 15 20 years ago now. Um, was uh, erected back in, I think, 2014 uh, to commemorate the players. And so all of the players' names at the time are all engraved in the base of the statue. So you can go through there and find your name if you play the game, which is kind of neat. Their offices used to be right over there. So let's go through and take your questions. Uh, the top upvoted question was from La Cucaracha. La Cucaracha. How can I identify how SQL Server is using all that memory? I have a couple of SQL Server 2019 Enterprise Editions, and if I don't set the RAM limit, it'll eat up all of the RAM. I've specified the limit, and SQL Server will always use all of it. So here's the deal. Your storage is inherently slow, is way slower than memory. So what SQL Server tries to do is it tries to cache as much of the database as possible in memory. You have that memory for the server. SQL Server believes it's dedicated. The server is dedicated to just running SQL Server. So why would we not cache as much as we possibly could in order to make your queries run faster? You don't get a refund if you don't use the RAM, right? So why not just go ahead and use all of it? That's normal behavior. SQL Server won't back down unless it comes under pressure. I won't back down. Uh, won't come won't back down unless it comes under pressure from other systems and processes. So if you've got a SQL Server and you've given it a certain amount of memory, that's how much you should expect it to use. That's normal behavior. If you need it to use less for some reason, give the server less RAM and set max memory lower. But otherwise, use it. That's what it's for. It's, and especially when you look at SQL Server Enterprise Edition's pricing, it's like $7,000 US per CPU core. You should feed it lots of memory. Memory is relatively cheap compared to the, the uh, Enterprise Edition licensing. Uh, next up, we have uh, Need for Speed, who asks, do you think that table compression is a good way to speed up query results? What are the potential drawbacks? I have a two gigabyte database and 64 gigs of RAM. Okay, no, no, compression doesn't make any sense at all in that scenario because the, the data already fits entirely in RAM. Compression only adds overhead because SQL Server has to decompress that data as it's working on your queries. So no, that compression isn't the solution there when your database is that much smaller than memory. You do mention also that you only have four cores of CPU. Compression is also CPU constrained. So you just want to be careful when you've only got, you know, less cores than my phone. Uh, you want to be really careful about what uses CPU, but that's not your server's big bottleneck. Next up, uh, someone asks, Iceland, they call themselves, asks, do you plan on doing office hours uh, by taking public questions for the long term? I love the scenery and great sense of humor. Thank you, I'm glad you like it. Um, in terms of long terms, I wish I would have started earlier as we were traveling through the country over the last year, but I'm actually leaving Iceland at the end of September. So you got about another two months of these where when I'm moving around to different places, like next week I'm in the Westman Islands, um, I'll be doing office hours. It's also just a really easy way for me to answer questions quickly when I got like half an hour in the mornings in between, like I woke up at 3.30 a.m. this morning, did some work for a while, uh, and then as I went out to go get coffee, which I put too low down here, I should have put it next to me, as I went out to go get coffee, I was like, oh, let me just hop out of the car here and do uh, questions by the EVE Online statue, which I think is just really cool. Uh, when I get back to San Diego, I'll do it every now and then, but I don't expect to do it as often once I'm back in San Diego. Next up, latest and greatest asks, jeez, I didn't even take a sip of my coffee. Latest and greatest asks, I have SQL Server 2012 and I'm interested in upgrading to 2019. Can I upgrade straight from 2012 into 2019, or should I upgrade 14, then 16, then 17, then 19? What's your recommendation for SQL Server upgrades? 
My recommendation, now of course you asked for my recommendation, my recommendation is that you never, ever, 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 ever upgrade in place. Never, period, I don't care, the end, never upgrade in place, period, full stop, end of story. You always want a back out plan. So that's why you would build a new operating system from scratch on a new server, build the, put the new installation of SQL Server onto there, and then you do things like log shipping or database mirroring to copy the database over in place and test it over on SQL Server 2019. Prayer is not a strategy. Hope is not a strategy. You're working with very expensive data, like your company's plan jewels. You don't juggle that in glass eggs. You, you're very careful with that. So never, ever, ever upgrade in place. Next up, just in case that wasn't clear, never upgrade in place. Next up, we have a name that I'm not even going to try to pronounce, Parallele Pepiedo, uh, who says, and I just tried to pronounce it, who says, what's your experience storing JSON on SQL Server as a means to have a, no, a, a NoSQL and relational database? Does SQL Server provide, provide good performance? I'm thinking about using JSON for my next app on an existing SQL Server database. If you want to store JSON data in the world's probably second most expensive place to put it, the most expensive place would be Oracle. The second most, most expensive place to put it would be SQL Server. So if you want to light piles of money on fire, sure. If you don't want to light piles of money on fire, and if you're building, you said, a new application, and you're going to use JSON, go put it in a JSON-focused uh, database. There are so many cheap, open source, un uh, limitlessly scalable cloud databases too that specialize in that kind of thing. Don't use a relational database if you're not going to do joins. Why would you spend $2,000 per core CPU uh, for standard edition or seven grand a core for enterprise? Yes, my answer is dramatically different than the one that a lot of people at Microsoft will give you. A lot of people will say, by all means, put your JSON data inside a SQL Server. Put in your files, your music, anything you want to store in SQL Server. Come on down. Because they would like to take your money, whereas uh, I'm not getting your money. So I don't want you to do something stupid like that. Nesting Nightmare says, what's the best way to speed up my page load? Is there a better way to reduce my round trip database times by running nested stored procedures and returning multiple result sets? Or would it be better to keep my connection open and send multiple individual requests? And the answer was nesting, or the, the question was from Nesting Nightmare. So I'm gonna, I'm gonna answer your first part of it. What's the best way to speed up page load? Caching. Caching. Most of the time when I see people trying to micromanage results, we look at the queries that they're running and they're running the same queries over and over. Show me the products for the category boat parts. You know, show me the list of users. You know, this is stuff that just doesn't change. Cache it. Cache it on the application tier. I don't mean in the database. Cache it in the application tier using things like Redis or Memcached so that you're getting the data straight out of RAM somewhere, which is so much faster. The other part of your question is, should I have nested stored procedures with multiple active result sets or different... I, I don't like multiple active result sets. I want to keep things as simple and pure as possible. If you have a query to run, pass that query into the database, get out, be done, walk away. So that way you can reuse the same stored procedure in lots of places, as opposed to having to handcraft a specific stored procedure for every page with the exact list of queries that it needs. If you have independent stored procedures that each return their own result sets too, you can do things asynchronously on the front end by firing off query requests, including multiple different query requests at the same time and managing their result sets independently on your side. Hello, connection pooling. Big fan of that. But caching, el numero uno. Data Warehousing asks, what's your favorite ETL tool? I don't do ETL myself. I focus on the SQL Server engine itself for performance tuning. 
things like SQL Server integration services and Azure Data Factory, they really just only share names with uh, Azure SQL DB and SQL Server. They're not the same product. They're totally different products. Um, so I don't do any work with it. I wouldn't be a good person to answer that question. The thing that I would say is if you're learning a new ETL tool from scratch, I just realized I don't have any hair product in today. That's because today is a spa day and I'm going to the spa. So just so that you know, that's why I don't have product in in Iceland. All the spas, the like hot tubs and, and public pools and all that are fed with constantly refreshing water. Now, like they, they have geothermal water so they get free hot water uh, straight out of the ground or they use hot water out of the ground to, to feed uh, to heat regular water but they make you take a shower before you go get into the sauna well i didn't want to bother having hair products in there so that's that's why that is where were we my favorite etl tool so if you're learning an etl tool from scratch uh, today in the year 2021 i would look at something that's serverless like whether it's an AWS Glue or an Azure Data Factory, something that will scale out much more easily and that you don't have to pay big licensing costs for. Because ETL is inherently bursty. You, do, you need a whole lot of power very briefly and then you don't need any power again for a while. So the tools like AWS Glue and Azure Data Factory take care of that for you by managing the scaling of the server side, managing the higher availability, things like that. Uh, next up, Acme Database asks, what are your thoughts on other relational databases like Oracle, DB2, MySQL, and Postgres? I think they're just tools. I mean, it's just like a hammer or a saw or a uh, screwdriver. They're just different tools and different people specialize in different tools. I happen to specialize in SQL Server. Uh, if someone was going to say, I want to pick a database to use for a new project, I'd say pick the database that you know the best you're gonna produce the best results with whichever database you know the best. If you force, to learn your, force yourself to learn a new database just for a project and there's not really a reason for it, like you think that somehow a database is going to be better, uh, then it's gonna cause a longer learning time and you'll ship the product slower. So. Uh, Cookie Monster asks, what would be the rule of thumb for RAM and CPU cores based on database size? I have 100 gigs of data and I store mainly PDFs and binaries. There's not really a rule of thumb for database size related to CPU count. It really all comes down to your query complexity, what it is that you're trying to do. For example, if you're storing PDFs and binaries in the database, my first answer would be, what the hell are you thinking? Why would you store PDFs and binaries in a relational database? That makes no sense, it's expensive. Uh, so I, I, wouldn't, I wouldn't just immediately jump to uh, CPU and memory. I'd be much more concerned about, why are we using SQL Server as a file server? There's a thing to serve files. It's called a file server. Go use that. They're inexpensive. They're practically free. They scale like crazy in the cloud. So that's the better answer that I would give there. It's funny. I would... So brief digression there, and I'm going to like wave the phone around to remind myself I need to put, start a new chapter here. Um, brief digression. Uh, this is one of the reasons why I would never be able to work for Microsoft uh, doing customer support or premier support or whatever. Uh, because they can't say things like, what the hell are you doing? Why would you do it that way? Uh, what they, they basically have to suck it up and support if Microsoft supports something, if SQL Server is allowed to do something, like when they bring out a new feature, like putting JSON in the database, uh, then their customer service staff have to patiently, tolerantly uh, work with customers as they do some of the dumbest things that I've ever seen, where it's luxurious as a consultant that I can fire a client if they go, I would like to run around with scissors. Can you show me how to run around with scissors without hurting myself? I'm like, no, you put the scissors down. You shouldn't be doing that. Uh, and if they refuse to do it, then I can just fire them. Whereas uh, if you're a customer support, you don't really get that choice. And then you uh, spend a whole lot of money on booze. I have so much respect for Microsoft support people. I know they sometimes get a bad rap because people will call in for support and they'll be dissatisfied with the answers that they get. Well, that's partially because Microsoft can't cut to the chase and say, look, dummy, you shouldn't be doing it that way. Uh, next up, we have No Index Life, who asks, is in-memory tables a good way to get good performance as opposed to standard tables? I have a one gigabyte database on SQL Server 2019 Enterprise. 
in-memory tables is really designed to solve a specific problem, latch weights. If you're not having latch weights, investing in time changing your application over to use code that works better within memory tables doesn't really make sense. He said that you have a one gigabyte database. Effectively, your data is likely to be in memory anyway, so the, the, the change over to in-memory OLTP is really about structuring the data differently under the hood to avoid very specific access patterns. And it's extremely rare that I see people who have those access patterns. Uh, so I, I don't think that that's a route to success for you there, no. Kakara Dudu, Kakara Du, Kakara Dudu, Kakara Du asks: We're using no lock in all of our queries. What's a better approach to reduce locking instead of using no lock? I would start with the approach that Azure SQL DB uses, which is they have read committed snapshot isolation on by default. Read committed snapshot isolation, RCSI. This is optimistic concurrency in which readers don't block writers and writers don't block readers. Uh, it uses SQL Server's tempdb to effectively uh, house a copy of the data that people are locking and then you can route around their locking very quickly. If you'd like to learn more about it, go to brentozar.com slash go slash rcsi brenozar.com slash go slash rcsi and there's a tutorial on there that explains you how to get started using read committed snapshot isolation. Next up, Accidental DBA says, how can I explain the difference between legacy cardinality and running SQL in backwards compat level to a non-DBA person? I'm asking for a friend. You shouldn't have to. Someone's not a DBA. That shouldn't matter to them. So uh, the other thing I'd say is, what's the problem that you're trying to solve? Ask me more about the problem that you're trying to solve, and I might be able to get you a better answer. But people who aren't non-DBA, that, that's like saying, how can I explain nuclear fusion to a friend of mine who's a fifth grader? I'm like, I'm sure there's a good answer out there for it, but I, I just am not going to get into the business of answering that because it doesn't make sense for a non-DBA. So. Next up, we have Pete who asks, we inherited a database. You need better relatives if they let you left you a database. We inherited a database. I know it's a bad joke, but I like that joke. I'm proud of it. I've done it several times over the years. It's old. It's like a dad joke. I'm not a dad, but I'm like an honorary dad because I use their jokes. We inherited a database and we <laughs> said that really quickly. We inherited a database and some of the tables have problems with the care data or have columns with the care data type, not ver care, but just plain care. Is there any benefit of changing the care data type columns to ver care? The, the thing that I get sketchy about is that anytime you change a, a data model, you change a data type and a data model, you run the risk of having to test every piece of code everywhere throughout the application. So it probably wouldn't be the lowest hanging fruit that I would go after. You did good in recognizing that the care data type is bad, but I just don't know that I would do that as my first lowest hanging fruit of uh, going to pursue changes. I would just make sure to coach everyone who's on the team to make sure that they understand that the care data type should not be used for building new code going forwards. Uh, next up, Alberto asks, Alberto, I'm going to go ahead and just skip your question. I'm going to be honest with you, Alberto. You've asked uh, like a dozen questions in the last couple of office hours. At this point, it's probably time for you to try things like other dba.stackexchange or sqlservercentral.com so that you can uh, go deeper in some of your questions with other folks. I just don't want to monopolize my time here. And also just if you find yourself repeatedly asking follow-ups to the same question, it's a good sign that it's probably time to hire me as a consultant or attend some of my training classes because this back and forth thing of getting additional details each time, it's kind of beyond what office hours is for. What Philip asks, what do you think about virus software running on SQL servers, good or bad, even with exclusions? I am a raving fan. I think antivirus software should be on every database server. Right about now, people are getting pissed off and they're typing in the comments, but here's the deal. I've seen what you people do on your database servers. 
I've seen people open up web browsers on their database servers. I've seen people surf the web. I've seen Adobe Flash. I've seen PDF readers, WinZip. I've seen an insane amount of software installed on SQL servers. I'll tell you, one time I saw people surfing the web from the SQL server because they said that the SQL server was in an area of the network that didn't have network rules. They're like, we can surf for things from the SQL server that we can't surf from our desktops. I am a huge fan of antivirus on SQL servers because y'all treat them like their personal laptops. If, on the other hand, you demonstrated good security practices and people weren't allowed to remote desktop into the SQL server and people weren't allowed to install software, then I would feel differently. But you, the great unwashed, are watching this through YouTube, probably on your SQL server right now. So that's why I'm a, a huge raving fan. Next up, Rojo says, given that SQL Server 2016 is solid, is there any reason or value to move to 2017 if I'm ignoring 2019 for now? For me, 2017, so reasons why I would consider 2017, column store indexes, if I remember right, had improvements in 2017 that it didn't have in 2016. Um, Multi-statement table valued functions would be another one that got slight improvements in 2017. But those are generally edge cases. It felt like 2017 uh, was more of an incremental release, excuse me, where Microsoft was focusing on a lot of things that weren't really important to me as a performance tuning DBA. Uh, there are improvements around availability groups and there was some stuff around Linux, if I remember right, but I don't see 2017 as a big, incredible jump from 2016. Uh, 2019 to me was a much more big, incredible jump where SQL Server made huge strides in a lot of areas or huge investments, that's the better way to put it, uh, huge investments in a lot of areas. So I wouldn't blame you for holding off on the, in, the work required to do a 2017 upgrade if you wanted to hold off for 2019 or whatever version comes next. Severio asks, since a back file contains the data at the end time of the entire backup operation, does this mean that backing up an unused database will take lesser size than the same database that's being heavily actively used at the time? And then he continues with, does this make sense to think about in a backup strategy? Not for me, no. I think about that differently. I think about it as, when you back up a database when it's not being used, there's not as much performance slowdown. If you back up a database at the same time that people are doing heavy inserts, updates, and deletes, then people are likely to feel that more. This is generally why people try to look for maintenance windows overnight to run their backups rather than trying to run their backups at 9 a.m. on a weekday if that makes sense. They're full backups, specifically. Uh, Camila asks, Hi, Brent. You're a great reference for us. Thank you. I appreciate it. And I'd like to know who your references are in your area. Thanks. Oh, the, the way that I'm going to say that is, who are the people who uh, I enjoy reading their material or watching them present? So the people that I love reading their material, I tend to be a T-SQL guy, T-SQL execution plans, um, and I want to read people who can manage to tell a story at the same time that they're teaching me things. So uh, probably off the top of my head, some of my favorite references are uh, Paul White, Paul White out of New Zealand, aka SQL Kiwi. Uh, Aaron Bertrand, uh, who is sqlblog.org, if I remember right. Aaron Bertrand. He also writes for MS SQL Tips. Eric Darling, out of Eric Darling Data, out of Manhattan. Brilliant uh, former coworker of mine. Um, and uh, Michael J. Swart is another one who doesn't write as often these days, but if you go back through Michael J. Swart's past work, you're going to be completely entertained uh, with great storytelling and T-SQL uh, work. There's another one who uh, doesn't, hasn't probably written a blog post in 10 years, and that's Brad Schultz. 
If you search for Brad Schultz T sequel, he has some amazing resources from the past. Uh, where, for example, he taught, if I remember right, taught T SQL Server how to play poker. Uh, showed how to play poker with T SQL. It was just really comically funny kind of stuff. Uh, so, yeah, those are the places that I would uh, go and start with. Drew says, where do you start with working queries written by someone else, especially if you're not familiar with the tables involved and any or any underlying schemas? So what I do is uh, I read the execution plan, right to left, top to bottom, looking for the place where SQL Server's estimates versus actuals went to hell in a handbasket. So read the actual plan, not the estimates. Read the actual plan right to left, top to bottom, looking for places where estimates went way the hell off, and then try to drill into why those estimates went way the hell off. I generally tend to not start with the T-SQL. I'll scan the T-SQL really quickly just looking for anti-patterns to see if somebody's using scalar functions, table variables, uh, the kitchen sink design pattern, like things that I know will cause bad performance issues that are really easy to fix. Uh, but otherwise, once I, if I don't recognize any of those anti-patterns, then I'll go off and look at the plan. And then uh, we'll take one more. Uh, Aaron says, oh, uh, Aaron, or no, Ar Ion, sorry, Ion says, it's a little wordy question there. Is there a module to write SQL queries natively in PowerShell for developer DBAs, like DBA Tools is for management and production DBAs? Meaning, also, do you offer your mastering classes purely using PowerShell? No. And I don't think that that's a route to success if you're going to be in the business of writing queries to give end users what they want. PowerShell is often seen as a golden ha hammer. Like the people who know it, the instant that they have any problem, they reach for the golden hammer. They'll see a screw that's halfway out of a socket and they'll be like, get me the golden hammer stat. I'm like, well, well, that's not really what that's, bam, bam, bam. And then the next thing you know, the screw is bent over sideways. I am a fan of PowerShell for what it's for, multi-server administration or administration tasks at scale. Uh, it, it doesn't make sense for things like tuning T-SQL or reading execution plans or tuning indexes. Uh, if you're going to use a language and you want to automate things like uh, doing index tuning, query tuning, performance tuning, etc., I wouldn't look at PowerShell. I would actually look at something that would be more developer focused. Because if you're doing performance tuning, you're more likely working with developers, not systems administrators. PowerShell is glorious for people who work with systems administrators. But if you work with developers and you insist on learning a language, I would try to learn one of the languages that your developers are learning because it will pay off more in your relationships with those developers and teaching them about their performance problems. Languages like that that come to mind would be things like C Sharp, Python, Ruby, Java, talk with your developers because they'll also be learning resources for you. But no, trying to learn performance tuning of SQL Server with PowerShell is going down entirely the wrong path. All right, sun's coming up here in Reykjavik, so uh, people are starting to get around, come around, and uh, I am going to start going around here. I'm going to go off and have my spa day, go, uh, go uh, soak up some... Uh, it's overcast, which is actually why we're doing the uh, spa day. We like going out to things like the Blue Lagoon and the Sky Lagoon here in Iceland uh, when it's overcast, because that way you don't get sunburned as bad sitting out in the pool for hours on end. They're glorious, like Google for Sky Lagoon or Blue Lagoon Iceland, and they're glorious, nice uh, open-air pools with bars and saunas. It's just a wonderful day to, way to spend a day. So I'm going to go head off and do that, and I will see y'all in the next office hours. Adios. Where's the stop button on this? It's always, why do they do it on the back side? <laughs>